Tunisians rise up again. With a struggling economy, increased isolation from the West, and continuing political instability, we ask what's really changed in the 12 years since the Arab Spring. I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Tunisia. Thousands have once again taken to the streets in Tunisia, 12 years after their Jasmine revolution. But their efforts this time are not to overthrow dictator Zini al Abidine Ben Ali. Instead, they're protesting the leadership of President Kai Said. The demonstrations coincide with the day Ben Ali's regime fell after its more than two decade long reign. It took just 23 days to overthrow him, but it set in motion a far greater movement. The uprising quickly spread from country to country in revolts against longtime authoritarian rulers in the Arab world and was coined the Arab Spring. But 12 years later, Tunisians say there's been no change. The country's been hit by a major economic crisis. Inflation and unemployment are on the rise, along with soaring food prices, plus shortages of fuel and basic staples like sugar, vegetable oil, and rice. And some feel their leader now has taken a page from Ben Ali's handbook. There was nothing good after Ben Ali. All those who ruled didn't change anything. Even now with Kais Saeed, nothing has changed. All the promises are false. There is no oil, no milk or anything. Education is lacking behind. Tunisia does not encourage you for anything. Nothing has changed over the past 12 years, except the country pushing young people to leave it illegally. I don't want anything from the state except a piece of land to support my family. I was hit with two bullets. The first one passed over my head and the second one hit my knee. The hole from the bullet that passed over my head is still on a wall at Avenue de Lyon. They haven't fixed that hole in the wall yet. How can I expect them to fix Tunisia? Everyone must work tirelessly to realize the demands of Tunisians. This requires concerted efforts to realize the economic and social demands of Tunisians. As for the political question, it has been decided and the matter is settled. Well, opposition parties have called for protests after a parliamentary election was held last month. Around 90 percent of the electorate did not vote, making what some call a powerful statement rejecting the rule of President Kai Said. The elections were called after Said's decision to suspend parliament and unilaterally dissolve the government in July 2021. He has since introduced a new constitution that concentrates power in the president's hands. A second round of voting has been set for January 29th, where the results will try to confirm 131 seats in the 161 member parliament. But after Said's constitutional changes, many regard the legislature as impotent. What do these elections represent? One would like to say not much. Why not much? Because, quite simply, these are elections for a parliament which will have no power, which cannot give its confidence to a government, which can only censor it under draconian conditions, and before which the president of the republic cannot be responsible for anything. So, it's a parliament without power. Now, with protests continuing, President Said is facing an uphill battle to improve the economy as Tunisia becomes increasingly isolated. The United States has slashed its military and civilian aid to the country, and an almost $2 billion IMF loan has been postponed again. Libya sent 96 trucks carrying sugar, oil, flour, and rice to Tunisia last week, but it's a short-term solution for the country, previously hailed as the only democratic success story from the Arab Spring. We are with the democratic model. We are with freedom, equality, and with a state of economic and social rights. But Qais Saeed does not see this. He does not see a revolution or a momentum in society. He only sees them as subjects. So is Tunisia just in the process of slow democratic transition? Well, joining me now to debate that are from Washington member of the Anahda Party and president of the Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy, Radwan Masmoudi, from Tunis, protester and human rights activist, Firas Nja, 
And also from the Tunisian capital, journalist at the national newspaper, Kaya Ben Mbarak. Thanks all so much for being with us. It has been over a year now since uh, Kaya's side took power and changed the constitution. And though some labeled it a coup, others were actually quite happy to see him take the reins because they didn't like where they thought the previous government was going. Firas, how does Tunisia right now compare to the Tunisia of even 2021? I think it's, uh, the situation is getting more critical. Uh, I personally was one of the people who searched uh, the process of 20, uh, 25 July. I was happy with, uh, with the abolishment of the parliament at first, but uh, things started to, uh, to turn over into a very critical uh, pathway. Uh, economic and uh, social problems are increasing. Youth demands are, are always increasing as well. So uh, as well as uh, the political engagement of, of youth and the results of, uh, of uh, the previous election have demonstrated that uh, the uh, public, uh, public opinion is no longer interested in what's going on and uh, the problems, the economic, economic problems and uh, social uh, insecurities are, uh, are, are the current debate. So tell us, I mean, you're saying Tunisians are unhappy with the, the conditions from the economy to, to social conditions, et cetera, but politically, what are they thinking? Politically, they are indifferent. Okay. Speaking of youth, speaking of youth, if I uh, if I allow myself to speak up, speak about youth, uh, no one is no longer interested in participating in the political life, and this has been uh, very clear in the, in the last elections with the percentage of uh, participation in uh, in, uh, in parliamentary elections and even in the in the number of candidates because uh, this has been the lowest percentage in, in Tunisia's history after the revolution. Okay, given their indifference very quickly, the indication then would be that they're just going to have to settle for a bad option. What is at the very least that bad option? I don't think uh, being, uh, being in condition uh, to, uh, to choose between two bad options, we have to choose like the slightest bad option. No, we have to create an alternative. And that's what uh, protesters and uh, human rights activists and defenders who are unhappy and unpleased with the situation are trying to do. Okay. Chaya, creating an alternative, is that the only real option here? And do you agree with, uh, with Firas's other, the other parts of his analysis there? Well, yes. So what Firas is saying, what Firas is describing is this sense uh, of political apathy that has taken over the street actually has been increasing throughout the past um, 10 years and has like incre has increased even further after uh, July 2021. Um, people are no longer um, caring about uh, what's like the political situation. And to put it within a context, that is definitely due to the degrading socioeconomic uh, conditions. You are now showing pictures of empty shelves like uh, in supermarkets. And that status quo imposes itself and makes Tunisians uh, only care about which political actor is able to bring them the uh, basic goods that they need at the end of the day in order to feed their mm. families. Now, there is that aspect. And the second aspect of which alternative do we have? At the moment, uh, we're not seeing any alternative alternative, to be honest. So uh, UGTT, the uh, Tunisian General Labour Union, and its uh, allies like from the Lawyers Bar and human rights, uh, 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 other human rights NGOs have been calling and have been trying to uh, bring together a new endeavor for uh, a national dialogue that's going to bring every single party on the political scene to discussion. But throughout my reporting and what I'm seeing on the street is that people are fed up with politicians. Mm -hmm. People... Uh, uh, do not see neither the president nor the current opposition uh, of being capable to actually bring about the change that the Tunisian um, people need at this point. Okay. Radwan, let me come to you. As a 
political party member, what do you say to especially the youth who just believe there are no good guys, there is no one worth supporting in Tunisia? Um, I understand their frustration. I understand that uh, Tunisians in general, uh, especially the youth, are, are quite angry and disappointed uh, in the achievements of the revolutions, uh, I mean, the Re Tunisian revolution since 2011. I understand that uh, frustration and disappointment, but I, I tell them that uh, there is only one solution. There may not be the right individual or the right party. We, are, we should not be looking for a savior. But the solution is democracy. The solution is uh, participatory politics, mm -hmm. is competitive politics, is to create real political parties that have uh, programs and can compete based on their programs. And we can look at uh, different situations in different countries. Countries that have adopted democracy have been able to achieve not only uh, stability and social cohesion, but also economic development. Uh, it may take a while. It may, it's not a, a magic wand. It's not something that will change overnight. But clearly, democracy is the only way to go and the only solution. Dictatorship is not a solution. Qais uh, Saeed may have had the best uh, intentions. Uh, it's hard to judge the intentions of any individual. But if you are in a dictatorship, if you are control everything, one person controls everything, that automatically leads to not only severe human rights abuses, as we see today in Tunisia, but also the collapse of the state, the collapse of the economy. Uh, Qais Saeed has shown that he is incapable of ruling Tunisia or of providing any solution. So we need a democratic solution. We need to go mm. back to democracy, and we need to create and by the way, I don't think that before the coup of uh, July 25 that we had a real democracy. I think we were still working towards achieving democracy, towards building mm. the institutions of democracy. But it was not a real democracy. Okay. It was still work in progress and still uh, incomplete right. uh, democracy. Still a slow process. Um, Fidel, let me ask you, you know, are some field Tunisians are just expecting too much, especially the youth. Most countries on the planet right now are suffering from economic instability, or even worse, especially when you look at some of Tunisia's neighbors. What can Tunisians realistically expect? What can Tunisians really expect is uh, a real decent life, because uh, a decent life is hard to be achieved at the moment. Uh, people are, are, are demanding the least I mean, uh, when we talk about transportation, when we talk about food supplies, when we talk about education, when we talk about health sector, all these institutions are corrupted, uh, not just by uh, sides uh, personals, I mean, by, uh, by the previous governments and previous, uh, previous, uh, previous rulers, previous authorities who had participated or had led or resulted uh, to the current situation. So, uh, what, as a realistic demand for Tunisian is to have a decent life. Okay. Which has been really hard to achieve. Indeed. And, and Tunisia is, is not alone there. Uh, Chaya, let me ask you, I'd like to move on to another strand of uh, the conversation here. There has been, as you may know, criticism of the United States in particular for not taking a strong enough stance on Tunisia. I mean, after the parliamentary election last month, it had around 11% voter turnout. Uh, the U.S. State Department said it was, quote, an essential initial step toward restoring the country's democratic trajectory. Is that correct? Or is the U.S. ignoring a leader that is hardening his grip on power, as some would see it? I mean, to be honest, I disagree about people labeling the U.S.'s reaction as uh, lower than expected. To be honest, anything further than those statements or further than the statements of Secretary Blinken in his meeting with President Qais Saeed uh, in the U.S. would be labeled as uh, some sort of uh, uh, meddling. Uh, let's always like remember that uh, the matters taking place within uh, Tunisia is... Uh, honestly, uh, an internal uh, matter that 
is a bit like uh, sensitive to tackle when we talk about uh, diplomacy and when we talk about reactions of um, other um, of uh, other countries. But I definitely at this point I did I disagree about people labeling the U.S. reaction as the bare minimum. So far, we've seen strong uh, reactions from whether like the um, U.S. embassy in Tunisia or uh, like. Like official uh, stances or um, like addresses by uh, U.S. Secretary of State uh, Blinken. Hmm. Rabban, let me ask you on the same thread. I mean, do you feel the U.S. has a responsibility um, to protect democracy outside the United States, including in Tunisia? Because, as you know, people's sometimes definitions of democracy or a functional government, you know, can vary under different conditions. No, oh, absolutely. I think, first of all, democracy has to come from within. There is no question about it that, first and foremost, it's the responsibility of Tunisians to defend their democracy, to protect their democracy, and to define even their democracy, how they want democracy to work in the Tunisian context. That's up to Tunisians. However, the international community, not just the United States, but all the democratic nations in the world, have a responsibility to defend each other against attacks against democracy. Um, in the beginning, uh, some people may not have called what Qais Saeed uh, uh, did on July 25 as a coup, because in the beginning, he didn't say that he was going to abrogate the constitution, that he's going to write his new constitution, that basically he's going to change everything. He said, no, he, he said the contrary. I'm going to respect the constitution. I'm going to respect democracy. Now, I think it's obvious, and all the political players, leaders, uh, political parties, uh, NGOs in Tunisia today agree that what he did is a coup against democracy, and that he is leading Tunisia towards dictatorship, and that he has now control, total control over everything in the state. And this is undemocratic, and this is unacceptable. And I think the United States, the European Union, all the democratic nations, have a responsibility to help uh, democracy uh, succeed in Tunisia, not by imposing democracy, but by helping the Tunisian people, by supporting them economically and politically and technologically and in every way possible, and by not providing any support to a coup. Mm. If there is a coup against democracy in Tunisia or anywhere else, it must not receive international support because it's illegal it's okay. unconstitutional and there is there is a an international order that has to be protected and has to be supported okay firas I, I need to get your opinion on what you just heard from radwan because if it is the case if this was a coup and there is now this concentration of of power in in kai Saeed's hands then your apathy for example would be pretty dangerous um, why don't you feel that there is, you know, real reason at this point to be less apathetic uh, to what's happening in polit politically in Tunisia? Yeah, because I personally believe that uh, nobody is ent entitled to defend the Tunisian democracy only by the Tunisian people. So let's let's put this thing uh, first, and uh, and starting from that point, uh, to respond to what uh, Mr. Radwan has been saying. Uh, about the Western support to the Tunisian people and the economic and social support, uh, these actors uh, did not support Tunisia during the ten the previous ten years. So why uh, why should they do it now? That's that's the main concern. Mm. Okay. Can I can go, I respond please, to go that? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, uh, I I agree with Firas that they did not provide enough support. Uh, they did support Tunisian democracy, but not enough in the past 10 years. And I think they need to support it more. I, I've been calling for a, a, a Marshall Plan, a Plan Marshall, uh, to help the economy of Tunisia. Since 2012, this is not something new. In the democratic transition, we need more economic support to stabilize the economy while the Tunisians figure out uh, their new political system, their new political parties, there is more. There is need for more economic support, and I agree that the support that Tunisia has received is not enough. But we need more support to stabilize our economy because success of democracy in Tunisia is important to Tunisians. Of course, that's the, 
our role as Tunisians, that's our main function and our main job is to protect our country and our democracy. But it's also in the interest of the neighbors of Tunisia. It's in the interest of the European Union. It's in the interest of peace and stability in the region. So uh, we are not isolated. There is no country that is isolated from everybody else. And so we say, OK, uh, you have no business. They do have business. For example, we are asking for an IMF loan. You know, and so there are conditions attached to the IMF loan to make sure that Tunisia is able to repay the IMF loan. So all the, we need support. You know, there is no de no question about it. Yeah. Uh, Kaya, let me ask you this. When I asked an opposition voice that I, I spoke to almost a year ago about the accused dictatorial nature of the coup, uh, he said, OK, Kaya's side is not al-Sisi and Tunisia is not Egypt. Do you agree? Would you still say that today? Or has Kai's side transformed into something closer to, to what Egypt is, for example? Well, first of all, I really disagree with people comparing Tunisia to Egypt or to any other neighboring country just because we are in the same region mm. and just because both North African countries and just because some people label what happened on July 25th, 2021 as a coup. We are completely two uh, different countries. It is sure I think that they're there looking are... at post-Arab Spring development in that context. Well, I also disagree with the labeling of Arab Spring. That's uh, too much of an Orientalist view. What happened is an uh, uprising, uh, to be honest, that is still continuing. And that did not uh, abruptly take place uh, on 2011. But what's happening in Tunisia, uh, Qais Saied power grab and Qais Saied uh, overthrowing of the parliament came within a specific context mm. of uh, discontent from the Tunisian people. And he actually took advantage of that. Uh, lots of people forget that Qais Saied is part of the regime that he is claiming uh, to abolish. He has a hand in terms of uh, uh, what happened prior to July 25th, but he just took advantage of that. Now, talking about present time, um, Qais Saied's actions uh, is growing further and further towards, yes, towards the dictatorial regime, towards um, a one-man uh, rule. But within all this country, we need to really look at Tunisia as one country. We need to speak about the what the people are demanding. The one thing I disagree with, with uh, Mr. Masmoudi, yes, it is important today to talk about the future of Tunisian democracy that is still, um, like, uh, even like prior to July 25th, was still like in its like building phase. But what we need also to mention is that the US or the EU are not... Um, like one model that every country around the world needs to follow. There are uh, specificities mm -hmm. to the Tunisian context. Uh, people have long asked, like the claims of the revolution, what people asked for when they went to the city, they asked for freedom, they asked for social justice, and they asked for employment. Now, right. I was in Gafsa a couple of weeks ago in the South, and people have told us we did not ask for democracy, we asked for social justice, we asked for employment, we had socioeconomic demands. Now here, like listening to what Mr. Masmoudi is saying, is really puts like our hand, puts our fingers on why there is this like ongoing gap between the Tunisians, regular Tunisian and political opposition and both the government. I think the focus today needs to be on fulfilling the aims of the revolution in terms of okay. social justice, regardless of whatever system we are within. Okay, People we're down to our side. last few minutes, Kaya, and, and I want to get Firas in because, yeah, having heard that, I, I can see... I need see to you. answer quickly. I need to answer that question very, very quickly. Very quickly, Radwan. Even, Gaia, even if we agree that our main goal right now is social justice and economic development, the only way to achieve that is through a democratic system. That, that's what the lessons of all the nations in the world, not just Tunisia, all the nations in the world, have shown that if you really want social justice and economic development, you only, even if you forget about freedoms, you can only achieve them through okay. a democratic system, not through a dictatorship like Qais Saied is trying to do. And you can see what Qais Saied has done. You can see what Qais Saied has done in a year and a half. He has destroyed the economy. Okay, let me get Firas's final words then. Go ahead. I mean, how, how, yeah, how so are you feeling about the prospects for your country now? 
it's 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 uh, it's really frustrating. I think all uh, political uh, political parties and all uh, all uh, parties involved okay. in public life in Tunisia are concerned about the social Fidas, justice. Fidas, un unfortunately, your your microphone is struggling. We could just make out what you had to say, so I'm I'm glad you got your final words in. Uh, but unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists so much for being with us. Our viewers, of course, for tuning in as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.